All right. I think everything's working. Looks like it. Looks like the mic's working. Looks like the camera's working. I think we're good. So let's get disclaimers out of the way. We'll jump into it here. Somebody will tell me if we're not coming through clear or something, I'm sure, but I think we are. So this is a weekly live broadcast. This is every, pretty much every Thursday evening, seven o'clock central. Uh, feel free to join us here if you have a question. I haven't been good about responding to comments. So if you've got a question that's come up in the comments section, I haven't responded to and you need it answered, you can come in here. I'll do my best to get it answered in here. I try to respond to everybody uh, that, that chats in during the live broadcast itself. Uh, usually get to everybody, but you know, sometimes, you know, don't, but you know, for the most part, I get to everybody. Um, all right, let's see. Somebody give me a response here. Let me know we're live because things seem kind of frozen up here for a minute on the chat. I see some chat, but I don't see anybody chatting right at the moment. So we'll give it a second here. Anyway, what I will say while I'm waiting on that, uh, is, you know, we, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about the, uh, uh oh, somebody's got some really good and bad news. So I guess the chat's working. Um, here and see me. Okay, good. We're good. All right, back to it real quick, and then we'll get into it. So we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. I'll, I, like I said, any comments, I, I try to respond to them all unless you're talking to each other, which is fine. Doesn't bother me. Uh, but I do ask that you be polite, be friendly, keep it family friendly. Don't be hateful, rude. Don't start cussing at us, any of those kinds of things. Other than that, it's pretty much all fair game. So let's get into it. We got Joy Guthrie from Western Oregon. Good to see you. And uh, Vern is here, Ray's place, says, hey, Chris, fourth like. Well, thank you very much. We got 10 likes already, and we just started. So that's all right. Uh, we got David Lister here. He says, uh, oh, she's saying, how, how are those kits going? David says they're little. Uh, got to show their picks to some five- and seven-year-old guests this afternoon. Uh, the kid got to hold the kits. Uncle John and I loved it. Oh, awesome. So, so Terrace here says, Hey, going to have to miss the show. Checking in to say hi. Read two o OFU does the other day for the first time. So, hoping for babies next month. It's all good. You don't have to worry about missing the show. You don't have to check in if you don't want to, but I appreciate it either way. So, hopefully, they took, I don't know what OFU stands for, but um, maybe, maybe it's something I should know, but I don't. Right offhand, so I'm, I'm having a hard time placing that. But anyway, thanks for stopping by for just a minute anyway. Uh, Joe Sandy's here, says, uh, hey, everybody. Uh, Sandy here from Southeast Michigan. I'm probably going to forget that you are Sandy. Call you Joe Sandy the whole time, but that's okay, won't it? Sorry, I got a notification. Wasn't sure what it was. Um, so Vern is posting a link for the uh, Quail and Homesteading Convention. That's coming up. Quail Con is what we usually call it, but I guess we're calling it Quail and Homesteading Con now, 2024. Uh, let's see. Verna says she has 10 kits that were born last Friday from two does. Well, awesome. Congratulations. And Sandy, I got it this time. I remembered. Sandy says, hey, Chris, I have really good news and really bad news. Uh-oh. Let's hear what it is. Show Me Bunny's here. Says good evening to everyone while we wait on that. Good news and bad news, I guess. Tony from Toronto, good to see you. And then we got, is that LLJ1027? Says, hey, Chris, it's nice to see that you are still doing this. I have really missed out on these videos. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, still going. Been slowed down on regular videos. I haven't been posting as much as I used to. Uh, I have a hard time coming up with topics to shoot. I was out of town this last weekend, so I didn't get anything shot. But uh, anyway. I'm here on Thursday evenings most of the time. Uh, Joe Sandy says, good news. My good news is I have 30 my share eggs coming into lockdown Saturday, my first hatch. Well, awesome. Good luck with that. Hopefully it goes well. We'll wait and see what the bad news is. Uh, Chris Mason says, uh, greetings all. Hope everyone's doing well. I'm doing well. Hopefully you are too. Uh, let's see. Uh, LLJ says, I like the t-shirt. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's one of my favorite ones. It's a little big on me. Actually, it's real big. My wife bought it for me and she thinks I'm fatter than I am, I guess, but it's still a great one. It's one of my favorite Ronald Reagan quotes of all time. I think I'm just barely old enough to remember Reagan, but I do remember him. I don't think I realized how great he was in a lot of ways, you know, until I was much older, but either way, he, he really did have some, uh, some great speeches. Chat's a little slow tonight, so I may have to come up with something else to talk about. And I don't have anything planned. 
I never do. I always say I should plan something out, but I never do. Bernard says, it is so true. Yeah, it is so true. We're waiting on Joe Sandy to tell us the bad news. What is the bad news? Oh, here it is. The bad news is on my way to Bible study Tuesday, decided to feed the quail first. A raccoon, I'm assuming, ripped the hardware cloth off my hutch and slaughtered all my hens. It was disturbing. Oh, no, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, well, you got new new birds coming, hopefully, to replace them. But, yeah, that is terrible news. I have never had, I mean, I've had raccoons try to get to my hutch, but they've never actually gotten into it. Um, but hopefully it's not something that's going to keep going. Um, <laughs> sorry, I got distracted there for a second. We'll get to that here in a minute. I'm not laughing at you. Hopefully um, it's not something that's going to keep coming back and happening again when you get new birds in there. Um, you know, you might stick a, if you have a trail cam, stick it out there and see if you got picture, you know, video of something coming by. So you kind of know how to deal with it. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, sorry to hear that. Hopefully it doesn't happen again. Like I said, Grace Young says, talk about Dale Earnhardt. Well, that'd be a short conversation. I don't really know much about Dale Earnhardt. I'm only slightly rednecked. I'm not quite rednecked enough to, to be into NASCAR. <laughs> uh, let's see. Michelle says, good evening. Good evening to you too. Uh, Christ is Lord says classic Chris with his Pepsi. Yeah, for sure. I'm a soda pop junkie. Yeah, it's Pepsi. I, and I'm not all honestly that picky. I mean, Coke is fine. Pepsi's fine. Cola flavored caramel covered colored beverage. That's pretty much it. All right. Spartman, welcome from South Dakota. Just setting up here, waiting for snowmageddon this weekend. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I hopefully um, we're done with snow. I hope. I don't know for sure yet. We're not completely out of the woods, but it's pretty nice today. Mid 60s, you know, high 60s, something like that. Real nice out. And then uh, we got a little bit of a cold front coming through, but it's not going to get all that cold. We're going to be down in like the 50s. So not bad. Um, Jennifer wants to know if you've started plants yet. And if so, what? No, not yet. I, I don't. We talk about this every week. And for some reason, I just haven't gotten to it. But yeah, I'm going to be I plan on getting some started this week. Now, my wife did plant potatoes today. She had the day off work and she got the potatoes planted. Uh, we had some that we had bought to eat, you know, from the store and they went to, you know, grew, grew eyes on them. So we planted those. That's what we did last year. And they actually did great. So, you know, why buy seed potatoes? Just buy potatoes. If you don't eat them and they go to seed, go ahead and plant them. But <clears throat> as far as seeds that I start indoor, really, it's not much more than just the peppers and the tomatoes. Everything else, for the most part, I just start outside. We've got a long enough growing season that it's not really that much of a benefit for me to start most of that stuff inside things like zucchini and squash and all that stuff gets so big, so fast that I just don't see the purpose in starting those indoors necessarily. Um, we've got Bob Cole from Western New Mexico. Good to see you. Um, we got, I am going to oh, back to starting seeds though. I am going to start some seeds. I scrolled too far. I lost track. There we go. I am going to scroll, start some seeds probably this week, um, start my peppers anyway, because they do take a little longer. I probably should have already started them, but um, I haven't yet. Uh, Bob Cole says, hello to Verna. Well, I usually skip over those, but anyway, hello to Verna. <laughs> Outside in Georgia says, trying to get into rabbits. Why, why do you say you can start out with four cages? Why not five? One for mom, other for dad, or wait, one for, mo one for mom, other mom dad and one cage for each of the mom's babies. Well, you can, you can do that if you want to. You absolutely can. Um, I start out with four cages because you know, usually I, you know, especially if you get meat rabbits that really grow out fast, I would just leave them with the mom until it was time to process. But it is good to have some extra grow out pins, some extra cages um, just to have on hand. But yeah, you can start out with five cages if you want to. That's not a bad plan. In fact, it's probably a good plan. Um, but you know, if you want to keep price, you know, price down initially, you can definitely start off with just three or four cages. Joe Sandy says, what stinks is it only ate half of the one and only ate the heads off the rest. What a waste. Yeah, that is a waste for sure. And very irritating. Almost sounds like a skunk. Don't skunks do that? Eat the heads off the animals. But you know, I doubt a skunk would crawl up under your quail hutch. I'm assuming it's raised and not on the ground. Yeah, that's what was more frustrating. That's the same thing with like squirrels and the fruit trees. They, they tend to go after all my, you know, fruit trees and stuff like that. And then just take like a couple of bites out of a peach and throw it on the ground. 
Um, and you'd rather just eat the whole thing. Just eat it. You know, be done with it. <laughs> Don says, good evening from South Central Illinois. Just passing through. I finally got out of bed after a month in and overdid today all day. Oh, no. I didn't know you were down. I'm assuming that being in bed for over a month, that means you were sick or something. I'm glad you're feeling better. I'm glad you're up and around. Uh, hopefully it's uh, not too bad. Bob says mid fifties today, but still have a snow drift piles in shade areas. Yep. And, and Verna says it was low forties there. Yeah. I've been there before. I remember that, but Joe Sandy says my pepper plants are up. I decided to start them early this year. They grow slow for me. Unlike tomatoes, which grow like weeds. Yeah, pepper plants do grow a little bit slower. Peppers are actually perennial, if you didn't know that. Um, so, you know, they just, they can't make it through our winters here, but they are perennial. So if you were to like dig them up and, you know, protect their root wads and get them, you know, put them in a pot at the end of the year and bring them inside, probably prune them up a little bit so they kind of stay dormant and uh, keep them alive all winter long and then take them back out in the spring, they continue growing. Um, but uh, I never do that. It's kind of a little bit of a, an annoyance. So Les with Pets is here says, Hey, exciting news. Well, hopefully that means you, your rabbits took and you, you got some baby rabbits maybe finally or something. I don't know. We'll see what it is. Or you got your license. Was that it? That was coming up. Wasn't it? Um, I don't remember, but let's hear what that exciting news is. I'm, I'm anxious. Uh, Don says I found my hydroponics disaster. So I worked on those as well. Hubby can't take care of plants outside and inside both. Yeah, it, especially if it's not your deal. It's just, that's a lot to do. I know. <clears throat> Christ is Lord says, okay, sticky situation for my egg incubator. What are your thoughts on adding more eggs to incubate once you've started a group? Well, I mean, you could try to do that. Honestly, I don't know how well that would work. Uh, some people I know use multiple incubators. So they'll, they'll incubate in one and then they use the other one like a hatcher. Um, and you could definitely do that. That let, that would allow you to rotate eggs in and out if you could keep track of which ones were where and how long they were been in there. When it's time for the others to go into lockdown, you just take them out, put them in the other incubator, and that's your lockdown incubator while the other ones continue to incubate. Um, but trying to incubate them all together and then go into lockdown, I mean, adding them, I, I don't know if I'd do that or not, but hey, if you want, go ahead and try. I mean, there's what are you going to lose, right? Um, I, you know, as far as my thoughts on it, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not something that I do. I just tend to set a bunch of eggs and then, you know, that's my hatch. And then I set more if I want more, but yeah, you can do it for sure. Don Skin says, hello from South Mississippi. Good to see you. Uh, Fat Country. Good evening from Tampa. Good to see you too. Uh, let's see. Um, Ray says, where did you, where did the expression John Jacob Jingle Heingemer Schmidt come from? I, it was a song, but I don't know where that came from exactly. Do you know the answer? Are you just asking for curiosity? You want me to Google it for you? Find out? Let's see. Um, according to history, the rhyme is based on an immigrant man. His name comes from an old origin in Germany. Coincidentally, there is another man with the same name in the same place. People like to pronounce this hard name whenever they see them both together outside. Interesting. I didn't know that. Um, Joe Sandy says, yes, it's raised. It was a Dale's quail hutch. Oh, no, it was. So I'm guessing you're not going to repair it. Did they destroy it completely? Either way, uh, he, yeah, he makes good hutches. Those are nice. Um, but, yeah, being raised, I find it hard to believe a raccoon would crawl up there and be able to tear the hardware cloth off. But I don't know what else would be either. So who knows? Um, outside in Georgia says, thanks for the, oh, wait, Spider Reba says, hello, everyone. Happy Easter weekend. Yeah, that's, uh, is that this weekend? That's next weekend, isn't it? Let's find it. When, when is Easter? Yeah, March 31st. So yeah, not this weekend. That's coming up next weekend, but that's okay. Better a week early than too late, huh? Outside Georgia says, thanks for the answer. Never realized you could leave the babies in the mother's cage all the way to butcher. Well, it depends. Um, you know, you can absolutely do that. Um, I don't do that right now because my rabbits grow out a lot slower. I like to get them, you know, about six to eight weeks, somewhere right around in there, split them up, male and female in separate cages, because uh, I just want to give the mother a break from them, of course, at that point. But when I had rabbits that were growing out to five pounds at eight weeks, yeah, it was no big deal. Just leave them in the cage with the mother and 
till processing time. Uh, Alaska Nomad says, hello from Tennessee. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, Don says, I've watched rabbits pull a whole tomato off and eat the whole thing. <laughs> rabbits, huh? I've never had rabbits really go after... The rabbits around here tend to go after like small plants when they're first sprouting. They'll nibble them and nibble them down and do a little bit of damage, but not terrible. Um, but I've never seen them once the plants get big. It's usually not a problem. Um, and I've never seen them go after whole fruit on a plant before. But hey, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Chester says, uh, good evening. Good evening to you, Chester. Um Chester says, finally got my rabbit stock going. Well, that's awesome. Congratulations on that. Grace Young is laughing about something. I'm not sure. What, is that the, was that me Googling that for you? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so Dawn's talking to Verna, but she says, I was so excited last night when I discovered a way to get out of bed. I woke up all night long thinking how great it will be. It could be months before actual surgery. So you got surgery coming up. I didn't know that. Well, we'll pray for you. Um, Grace Young says, you're so awesome. I'll be subscribing. Huh? Well, thanks, I guess. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, Ed got Bates here says, Hey, Chris and Verna, hope all is well. It's well with me. Hopefully it is with you too. Spider Reva says, just in case I'm on the chat next week. Oh, wait, just in case I'm not on the chat next week, LOL. What? Um, I'm not sure what was just in case. What, what did I forget? I don't know. I'm lost on that. We'll see. Well, it'll come back up. Joe Sandy says, I'm going to use a heat lamp for the brooding of the babies. I have secured it and double screwed it. Should the temp be 99 directly under it or higher than that in the center and 99 in the cooler areas? No, just if you can get it right, like right at 100 degrees or 99, you know, under the heat lamp, that's going to be fine. Don't worry about the rest. It'll be okay. You don't need to stress too much. Really just the first day or two is the most stressful with them, but you know, they're, they're going to be fine. If it's 99 degrees right under the heat lamp, they're going to be fine. Um, Tyler says I'm in South Louisiana. Okay. I'm not sure if that was a response to something else or either way. I've never been to South Louisiana. I've been just to the edge of Louisiana. I used to live in Nacogdoches, Texas, and it's not too far from Louisiana. I think I went over just to the edge of it right there, but that's about it. Um, Highway Homestead says, what are you doing differently now that makes your rabbits grow out slower? Nothing I'm doing differently. It's just the rabbits I have right now grow out slower than the ones I've had in the past. It's just genetics. Um, they're just slower to produce, and that's okay. It's not that big a deal for me. Um you know, when you get like purebred New Zealand's, purebred Californians, a lot of times they'll grow out super fast. And I've got purebred silver foxes. They just tend to be a little bit slower grow out. Um, Joe Sandy says, I will repair the Dale's quail hutch, but I'm building a famous slightly redneck hutch in addition. Well, awesome. Hopefully that goes well for you. I'm sorry I don't have better plans for it. I've had lots of people ask for plans, but... I don't build that way. I just kind of build it and you know, just kind of get an idea and, and, and it works its way out as I go. I did shoot video on it. So hopefully that was enough. But uh, anyway, it's not that complex. You should, you probably can figure it out. Uh, let's see. SO Swanson from Miss, uh, from Mississippi, I think it is. It says Mississippi. There's a, there's some letters missing, but anyway, we got it. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Andy Pearson says, Hey everyone, Chris, do you debone the rabbit and do you, have a video on that. No, I've never, I've tried to debone a rabbit before. I'm not very good at it. Um, it just didn't work very well when I did it. So no, I don't typically debone them. Uh, sometimes I'll cut the meat off the bone just if I'm going to like grind it for something or whatever, but I, I don't typically debone the rabbits. I've, I've never been very good at that. Chris Heitzeman, I think it is, says, uh, do rabbits have a cold temperature threshold where they need to eat more? I know cows do, but have haven't found rabbit or anything on rabbits. I'm near the Arctic circle. So prep before is important to plan for it. Uh, well, you know, I'm nowhere near the Arctic circle, but I can tell you, you know, we get pretty cold here. We got down below zero um, in the wintertime. I've never noticed my rabbits eating a lot more in the wintertime. 
maybe slightly more, but it's not noticeably more. So I don't think that they do really. Um, but somebody that maybe lives in a much colder climate can speak to that maybe a little bit better than I could. Um, Don says, Chris, my kneecap dislocated if I put weight on my feet. Oh, my kneecaps dislocated if I put weight on my feet. Uh, they're so past shot, it freaks the specialist out when they see them in the x-rays. I'm 100% non-weight bearing if they can do surgery. Oh, no. That does sound uh, painful. Hopefully that goes well. Rob Clark says, I have a one-year-old doe with lumps on the back of her neck. Any suggestions on what I should do? I was wanting to keep her for breeding. Um, yeah, I, good question. What are the lumps? I mean, are you sure they're not like bot flies? You know, look into that, look it up, make sure that's not it. Depending on where you live, probably not because we've been in winter time. So I wouldn't think, but you never know. I mean, it could, could be, um, if they're bot flies and that, you know, there's a, you could take care of that. That's a, that's not terribly, look it up on Google and you'll, you'll see directions on how to take care of it, how to tell if it's bot fly or not. Um, but that could be a lump. I mean, it could be, who knows what it could be. Um, I mean, it's hard to know just from a comment or even if, you know, seeing the rabbit myself, I'm not a vet. So it's hard to know for sure what could be causing that. I would say, go ahead and try to breed her if she'll breed. I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen is you lose the rabbit and you were going to lose anyway, if that happened, you know, if that's going to cause it. So I, I would say go ahead and breed her at least try and see how it goes. Um, look into bot fly. That would be one of the simple, easy things to kind of fix make sure it's not, if there's some kind of abscess there or something like that, if it's an infection, it needs to be drained. Um, other than that, I mean, the other things, I don't know. I mean, it could be cancerous of some kind. I don't know what it is. So it's hard for me to know for sure. Um, but, you know, I would just say look into those couple of things. Those are the two things that come to mind, bot flies or some kind of abscess that needs to be drained and taken care of. <clears throat> Don says the last dislocation was three days before I go got to the ER to push it back in. Oh, no. That sounds terrible. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'll be praying for you. S.O. Swanson says, your video was great on me building my redneck hutch. Well, awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Blessed with Pets says, well, not exciting news is my rabbits had a miscarriage on day 23. I don't know why, but really good news is we finally have baby goats for the first time. Well, oh, that's awesome. Sorry, is it about the miscarriage on the rabbits. I know you've been struggling with that for a little while. It'll work its way out, I'm sure. But baby goats are nice. So that is exciting news. Congratulations on the baby goats. Um, Joe Sandy says, Chris, I found a guy who actually has measurements and everything for your hutch. He makes very certain to give you all the credit. Well, awesome. That's very nice of him. I wish uh, I would have probably done a better job of taking the prints down and, the, and be able to share that with everybody. I just I don't know the way I build things. I just don't, I don't usually use plans. I just kind of build it, you know, and it works out better that way. Um, Christ the Lord says your quail hutch build is awesome. I have three, three by eights now, and I just love them. Thanks so much for your video. You did of that cage of yours. Well, awesome. Thank you for letting me know that. I'm glad to hear that it worked out well for you. Buck Grinnold says, hello to everyone. Hello to you. Good to see you. Joe Sandy says, I bought a miter saw to cut the lumber. I've always wanted one, so I got to use this as an excuse. Yeah, that's you could definitely do it without a miter saw, but it's a good excuse to buy one if you've always wanted one anyway. I'm jealous. I don't have a good miter saw. I do have a, you know, a, a, well, I have a, a cross-cut saw, but it's not a really good one. It's a really old one. I bought it at a rummage sale. My uncle actually uh, passed away, and, you know, my aunt, that was my actual blood relative. He was my uncle by marriage, of course. But anyway, um, she had ended up having a long time after he passed. She was going to downsize her house and all that. So they ended up having a big uh, rummage sale and I bought um, the chop saw from him. But anyway, um, Joe Sandy says, you did an awesome job. I love your video. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Christ the Lord says, uh, hi in the bread aisle. I needed to change that name born again. So that name had to go. What? What? Did I miss something? I didn't, I don't remember seeing another comment. I don't know what you're. Oh, oh, were you high in the bread aisle and now your Christ is Lord because you are born again. So that name had to go. Well, that is awesome news. So well, not that you had to change your name. I mean, you could have kept the same name. It had been fine. It doesn't matter. But awesome news to hear that you're born again. I like the new name. And Vern is saying you could have gone with 
high in Christ. Huh? I guess you could have. Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's a little weird, isn't it? But either way, um, yeah, change your name is fine. Shed the old, in with the new, right? All right, we need some more comments to keep up with things. I guess while we're waiting, we'll talk about it. I went to Eureka Springs over the weekend with some family. Uh, my family are my friends. They, they're, we're my, it's my cousins. We're all real close in age. So I should say my cousins, two of them, brother and sister, they're my cousin. And then, you know, my cousin's husband, he went with us. Um, you know, my wife, of course, and one of their friends. And uh, we just kind of hung out in Eureka Springs for the weekend. Eureka Springs, Arkansas, if you've never heard of it. Um, it's kind of a neat little town. Um, it's, it's very strange. It's a, it's an Ozark town in a lot of ways. Um, but it's, it's very much, uh, very quirky and a lot of new age stuff goes on there. So it's a little bit disturbing in that way. Uh, you'll, you'll go into a shop and it's like a typical, you know, um, Ozark. Oh, look at that. There's a super chat from Joe Sandy says $19 and 99 cent super chat. Thank you so much. Says you have been such a blessing to me. I'm glad you don't get annoyed by all my newbie questions. No way. Everybody's got questions. It's all good. I don't get annoyed by them at all, but thank you very much for the super chat. It's very kind of you. So anyway, let me tell you the rest of my deal about new about Eureka Springs. If you've never been there, it's a cool little town. It's pretty neat. It's very historic. The downtown's kind of cool. It's just, uh, you know, you just kind of walk around there and there's lots of little shops and all that kind of stuff in there. Um, but it's, you know, you go into a shop and it's like typical Ozarks, you know, you, you know, you see like bless this house and, you know, crosses and those kinds of things. And then right next to it, like crystals and, you know, all this new age stuff kind of mixed in with it. People just don't quite, I don't know, don't get it quite yet. I don't think, but anyway, it's a little bit disturbing in that sense. And, you know, you just kind of feel bad when people don't understand that whole, you know, new age stuff doesn't mix with Christianity. It's not, you don't don't mess with that stuff. It's bad, <laughs> but, but that's just, uh, my little preaching, I guess, for the day. Um, Bob Cole says I used your hutch guide to, uh, oh, but made it double decker. I wish I hadn't done. I wish I hadn't and don't recommend it. Yeah. Uh, I, I've always, I've seen some of those kinds of things like that, but it is kind of a pain in it. Cause you're going to have, if you've got double hutches, you're going to have to have something in between that catches the droppings. That means you got to empty them all the time and that's I, I don't like doing that so that is a lot of work uh christ says lord says haha you all are awesome well thank you uh verna says chris Smokey finally had his kits and her and her sisters both had them on the same day and i didn't think either were bred <laughs> yeah we always gotta just whenever you breed rabbits, it's always just, you know, you don't know for sure, but you just expect it, you know? And then if they don't have babies, they don't have babies. I did finally get babies out of my, my blue doe. She only had two. So I had really low litter counts, two on this one, five on the other one, but that's okay. We're doing okay with it. Abelove says, Hey everybody, I almost forgot to look on YouTube. I really enjoyed chatting with you all. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm sorry that sometimes, you know, you miss those, but that's okay. It doesn't hurt my feelings. If you don't make it to a live broadcast, I'm glad to see you here, but you know, if you can't make it, it's all good. Um, what else? What else? Anyway, so some of the neat things in Arkansas, Arkansas is a beautiful state. Um, well, the northern parts of Arkansas are anyway, uh, the Ozarks, uh, parts of Arkansas. Uh, just, you know, very cool. We went and saw uh, Blue Spring, which is a just kind of, it's, somebody owns it, you know, and you pay some money to go walk around through there and check it out. But it's a cool, cool spring, you know, Ozark Spring puts out. Oh, it's like 50 billion gallons of water a day, something like that. It's it's crazy amount. It's pretty cool. Um, oh, here we got Joe Sandy says, Craig, Chris, do you feel it's beneficial to use coated wire for the floor? It's a lot more money, but if, if it's necessary because of Bumblefoot, I will. You know, I've heard people say different things about this. People talk about getting an issue. I don't really have problems. I mean, yes, coated wire is better for sure, but I don't use coated wire right now. I don't have problems with Bumblefoot. I mean, every great once in a while, I may get a, a bird that like limps around for a couple of days. Um, but there's no Bumblefoot issue with that. I don't know if they get their foot stuck or, you know, something like that. But you, and usually they get over it just fine. So I, I don't really have any issues with them. But, um, but yeah, um, is, is Verna saying, Sandy, either coated wire or 15 gauge to prevent Bumblefoot. I just use regular hardware cloth. I don't have bumblefoot issues. So, I mean, it's, I, I get it. 
you know, that's probably best practice, but it's not an absolute necessity. And if you have enough hardware cloth, you know, I know what you're saying. It's a lot more money. Of course, all you got to do is use it for the floor. So you don't need as much of it, but you know, something you can always change out later if you do start having issues too. Um, and she's saying 16 gauge rather than 15. Yeah. Oh, uh, let's see. <coughs> Chester says, I have New Zealand's and California's. Those are great choices for meat rabbits. Um, hard to go wrong with those, honestly. And of course, Verna's got the Havana rabbits. Those are pretty rabbits. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear they're doing well for you. Uh, PT Jeff says, I got my incubator. Can you please review? Oh, just got my incubator. Can you please review the best settings? So I, you know, the settings on the incubator, I mean, it's 99 degrees. It's a forced air, I'm assuming. So if it's got a fan in it and a forced air, you want it at 99 degrees, get some non cal you know, non, well, get some calibrated thermometers, get two calibrated thermometers, put them in the incubator, make sure that it's actually the temperature that the incubator says it is it's all incubators. I don't care what they are. They can be wrong. All of them. Um, so, you know, always double check 99 and somebody said 99.5, 99.5 is it? Yeah. 99.5. If it's not, if it's forced air, you want to go with 101 or excuse me, if it's still air, no fan, you want to go with 101, but a forced air kit with a fan in it, you need to go at 99.5. And that's pretty much it. Your humidity, really, you want to keep it around, you know, 50 to 60% until lockdown, bump it up to about 75%. It, humidity is not as big of a deal as temperature is, though. So if it's a little bit higher than 60%, that's okay. If, you, if it's a little bit higher than 75%, now you don't want it to go too high. You don't want it to be like 85% or 90% because then they'll drown. But, you know, other than that, you're you're going to be okay. Just bump it up a little bit at lockdown. Uh, that's going to be your best bet. And if you're like, we're, we're out right now and it's super dry right now because uh, it's still wintertime, really. Um, so we're like 30% humidity, something like that. So I do want to add water uh, to the incubator, try to get the humidity up a little bit, like I said, in the 50, 55% range, 60%, somewhere right around in there. And then again, at lockdown, 75, up to 80. You don't really want to go much over 80. So play with it for a few days beforehand, see what that's going to take, how much water that's going to take, all that kind of stuff, and you'll figure it out. Bob wants to know if I ever dry hatch. In the summertime, I have. Um, I still add some water at lockdown to get the humidity up a little bit then. But in the summertime, when our humidity outside is like 65 70%, I dry hatch and it works just fine. But in the wintertime, when it's still dry out, I, I do need to add. I mean, if my skin's still drying out and I have to use lotion to keep it from you know, really getting bad, then, um, <clears throat> then yeah, I, st I put water in. I keep the humidity uh, up a little bit. Uh, Joe Sandy says, um, I wish I had bought two meat thermometers and calibrated them. Rather, I got a Govi and I just blindly trusted it. I'm praying it didn't make a mistake. Yeah, I've got a Govi thermometers right now. They seem to be pretty good. So uh, I think those will work just fine. I've used Meat thermometers. Now, the thing you got to work about on a meat thermometer, and everybody always wants to know, do you have a specific recommendation? I don't. Just meat thermometers can be calibrated, and I guess the Govi can too, but it's a little bit easier with a meat thermometer. Just make sure that you get one that will read low enough. A lot of meat thermometers don't go down to 100 degrees, and you need it to go low enough. So, you know, just make sure if you're going to get one, and it doesn't have to be an expensive one, and then just look up how to calibrate them. I could explain it to you, but it's a little bit, it's not terribly difficult, but it is a little bit. I got I got to refer to notes because I can't remember the specifics on exactly all of it. Uh, Buck says, when you are breeding rabbits, if you will breed them of a morning and then wait five or six hours and breed them again, you'll get more baby because their eggs will be coming down and get a better average. Yeah, you know, you're probably right on that. I've never done that, never had problems with litter size, but um, but you know, it's probably a good practice. So I, I maybe I'll do that again next time and see. Um, this is another question I get quite frequently. Let me grab a drink here and then we'll get to it. Uh, Big Ross wants to know, do you ever soak or ferment your quail feed, your bird feed? I don't. I mean, you could if you wanted to. I hear some good things about it, but I don't do it because it's just more work. There's no, I don't see any reason to do it. So no, I don't. Um, you know, the benefits of fermenting quail feed are like it adds probiotics. The fermenting process does. 
Um, but honestly, I don't really think that's that big of a deal. That's big of a benefit. Um, it's not like magic. Like, you know, there for a while people were, you know, boasting. I mean, it was like apple cider was apple cider vinegar was like boasted. Like, I mean, like people were preaching about it. Like it was like some kind of magic cure for everything. And it's not, there are probiotics in it. It's good for you. It's just like, you know, yogurt or any of those other things. It's the same lactobacillus bacteria in that sauerkraut that's not canned, you know, sauerkraut has the same things in it and it is good for you, but it's not going to cure you of anything. It's not magic. So I don't really see the big benefit compared to the amount of work you got to put into it to ferment it. I, I don't see it. Now, some people have claimed that when you soak your feed, there's less waste, but I don't get that much waste with my feeders. So it's again, not a big, not a big benefit for me and it's extra work and I just don't want to do it. So I, I don't mess with it. Joe Sandy says the Nurture Right 360 had to be set to 100.5 to agree with the Gobi at 99.5. Well, you're probably good. I, I mean, I wouldn't stress about it too much. Um, Vernus says Sandy Gobies are pretty accurate, but in Facebook newbie quail lovers, there is a post that tells you how to calibrate them. Yeah, there is. And you can actually just Google it, how to calibrate a Gobi thermometer in there. It'll give you instructions on it. Andy says, uh, Andy Dundas, I think it is, says, hello from Southwest Michigan. Hope everyone's doing great. I'm doing well. Hopefully you are too. Des says, what is the least amount of baby quail you can introduce to a current flock? I released a single three-week-old chick and the current flock killed her. And then there's more to that, but it cuts off. Um, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I don't know. I've, I don't know that I've ever done more, less than like 10, you know, but... I didn't, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't think there would be any issue with that three week old and the current flock killed her. That seems kind of crazy. Um, um, sorry, got distracted again. So yeah, I don't know uh, what the least amount you could do would be. Um, man, I'm sorry to hear that happened. I don't have a good solution for that, unfortunately. Maybe uh, like it may be just a low number. Maybe try again with at least four or five and see how that goes. Uh, Joe Sandy says, uh, you, you don't grind your food, right? The baby quail eat crumbles without grinding. Yeah, I don't grind food. You never have to grind the food for them. If you're feeding crumble, baby quail are going to do just fine on it. In fact, there's some concerns if you do grind it up too much that they can end up with respiratory problems or choking on it, getting it stuck in their crop, all those kinds of things. So it's really best not to do that. Hey, there's Andy Rabbit. Good to see you. Andy Rabbit says, I just got back home from picking up my granddaughter. Well, awesome. Thanks for joining us. Verna says, Sandy, do not grind the food for baby quail. Better to just let them have the regular crumble. And I agree. Yeah, there's no reason to crumble it up. In fact, like I said, there are some concerns. It could cause issues. Uh, but for the most part, they're fine. They can eat without the crumble. It's not going to hurt them. They're going to do just fine. Chris, Christ is Lord says, what about the incubator, uh, the humidity inside the incubator reading 47 to 49%? Is that too low? No, that's not too low, really. Um, you know, but you're going to have to watch it. Let it run for a couple of days if you have, if you have the opportunity to do it. It's probably going to be, um, humidity will jump up really high when you add water or if you've, you know, done any kind of cleaning in the incubator or whatever beforehand, it'll jump up and then it'll lower back down. Uh, so watch what it is. Play with it a little bit. See how much water you need to add to get it where you need it to be. Uh, scuba Healer says, I made the mistake of brooding chicken and baby quail together. Big mistake. Hello from Idaho. Yeah, I can imagine that would be a big mistake. But uh, yeah, thanks for sharing, though. Just let us know. Uh, Joe Sandy says, that's what I thought. Uh, but so many people on the newbie group do it. I guess I'm just nervous about my first touch. Yeah, lots. I've seen lots of people talk about grinding food. I've seen videos about when do you stop grinding the food for your baby quail, and you don't need to do it. It's not going to do anything for them, but could possibly cause some issues. So don't do it. Just don't worry about it. Big Ross says, planning on any new critters around the homestead? Maybe the IBC aquaponics system and catfish or something? No, um, <clears throat> I looked into doing aquaponics for a little while, but you know, it gets so cold here in the winter time that I just don't want to have to mess with it, you know, during that time frame. You know, I know you could do catfish, you can do bluegill, you can do some of those kinds of things. Tilapia is what's typically used. I think tilapia is kind of, I don't really care for tilapia much. Um, and they wouldn't make it through my winter anyway. So, you know, I just, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of work 
so I'm not really planning on that. I do have meat chickens I'm planning on coming in, getting in. I need to get those ordered. I've been procrastinating. I've been so lazy. I just haven't done it, and I just need to get on it. Um, let's see if I've still got. So right now, it looks like it's going to be May before I can get them. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I waited too long. Should have got those ordered a couple of weeks ago. Didn't mean to wait, but I just did. Um, Andy Rabbit says, it's been a long day for me. Oh, I understand. Gun Klingon Palin says, hey, all. Or hey, y'all, I think it is. Hello to you, too. Thanks for joining uh scooby healer says we need some thumbs up well yeah we got 34 in here we got 46 people we're doing pretty good um andy says if i did it i would want perch fish yeah or crappie would be a good option too if you could get them to live the problem is getting them to trying to find something that will reproduce in captivity and that's the trick i don't know if i'm guessing perch probably would but it might take a long time for them to get any, you know, get plenty big enough for you to, I mean, it's hard to find a perch that's big enough to fillet. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, you know, I've seen people do it with like bluegill, um, you know, and even those are, then we get super big. So it's kind of hard to find one big enough to fillet. The whole idea behind the aquaponics though, would be hopefully you would get a fish yield and, you know, be able to grow your vegetables and things like that. Jeff says, um, I got two dozen quail eggs off of eBay, and when I got them, every one of them were scrambled, smashed. Oh, no. I'm sorry to hear that. Somebody's uh, trying to start up a business but didn't invest in the right you know, um, equipment to be able to ship them out, unfortunately. Contact the seller. Maybe they'll replace them for you. David says, I have some silver fox pedigree bunnies. Yeah, that's what I'm raising right now, too. I like them quite a bit. Uh, they're great little rabbits or great rabbits, not little. Um, but yeah, I like them. But I do, like I said, they grow out a little bit slower. Mine do anyway. I mean, I'm sure that's not the case with every one of them. Um, but they're they're easy to handle. I, and that's what I like about them. <laughs> so Swanson says, uh, you said procrastinate. Don't procrastinate on quail and homesteading con 163 days. No, I won't procrastinate on that. I'll be there. Don't worry. Planning on being there anyway. I mean. Who knows what's going to happen between now and then, but I should be there. Uh, PT Jeff says, um, after I get the incubator stable for a day and then add eggs, I would assume the temperature and humidity fluctuate. How long would you wait before you start adjusting the temp and humidity? Um, I, you know, I, I, if you, if you've got it stable already running, you know, I wouldn't adjust the temp. I mean, I just let it go for, you know, a day or two at least. Now, if you, after about two days, you notice that it needs to be adjusted a little bit, go ahead. But chance, I mean, if it's stable and running before, it should stable out and run again after you've got the eggs in there. Humidity, um, you know, that you're going to have to continuously adjust probably if you want to keep it up there around 50%, uh, because chances are, you know, your, your water is going to evaporate and then it's going to start dropping. So you just add water as you need to. Like I said, figure out, like you probably got trays in your incubator. Just figure out how many trays you need to fill up Remember, humidity is um, is really affected by um, surface area of the water, not volume. So like a soda can like this, you may have just this much liquid, but if it's spread out in a you know wider area, wider tray, that's going to add more to your humidity than it is going to be set in a soda can like this because it's, it's very little surface area, if that makes sense. So figure out how many trays you need to fill up, fill the, you know, if it's got one little, um, what do you, I guess you call it a tray. I don't know if you call it a tray, you know, channel. There we go. And, and you fill that all the way up to the top and that gets your humidity where you need. Well, that's it. Just fill that up all the way to the top when it gets low and that's it. That's all you need to do. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> Pigeon Passion says, I've been watching your channel for years now and you have taught me a lot about quail and I enjoy your quail videos. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Vernon says, guy downstairs must be cooking. His fire alarm's going off. Well, hopefully he's cooking. Hopefully it's not a fire. Um, Joe Sandy says, I saw a thing on Caternix Corner that you just stick the head in and pull. Comes right off fast. 
did they call it was it their hand because you can just pop their heads off with your hand if that's what you're talking about i've done it plenty of times in fact at quailcon we tried to show uh bloodless call which is basically you, you you use your hands to kind of pull and dislocate the neck and that that puts them out and somebody popped the head off the quail on accident because it's not very difficult to do but yeah you could pretty easily derive some kind of little concoction to do that the only thing that's bad about that honestly is that it's kind of messy because you know they're bleeding and flopping you know around so it's a uh, kind of messy um but it is a uh, you know a, a good way to to be able to dispatch them pretty quickly um rbl jackson says yo what up just got in from working in the yard starting to see some green up yeah yeah our yard is too it's getting close i'm gonna have to mow here before long Don says, uh, had a good hatch this weekend, 50 eggs in the incubator, five were blanks of the 45 remaining, 37 hatched. Well, that's awesome. Very well. Uh, congratulations and well done. Andy Rabbit says, I think blue and perch are probably the same fish. I found it depends where in the country you're talking, uh, what they're called, LOL. Well, yeah, I mean, technically bluegill are a type of perch, but I think of perch as like sunfish, you know, so... You know, it's and those are a perch too. I mean, perch are actually bass are a type of perch too. They're they're actually related to perch, but you know they're much bigger. So you know, I don't think I don't call those perch either. So maybe it is just you know tomato tomato, I guess. Um, Don says we call them bluegill here. Yeah, well, bluegill, like I said, bluegill are a perch, but. Um, but I think, you know, when I say perch, I'm talking like sunfish, like th that kind of perch. To me, bluegill's a little different. Rock bass is different or goggle eye, depending on where you live, you can call them that. Anyway, um, Joe Sandy says, uh, okay, I don't know. He's talking to somebody else. That's okay. Andy Rabbit says, I think in Tennessee, it's perch. S.O. Swanson says, we call them sunfish. Yeah, sunfish is different from a bluegill. They're, they're different fish. Bluegill typically get a little bit bigger than your sunfish, uh, but they're all very similar. Andy says, I've lived in many places and remember where I am. Oh, I've lived in, I've lived too many places to remember where I am sometimes. Oh, I get it. Don says, Andy Rabbit, Lake of the Ozarks. When I lived there in Missouri, they were bluegill here in Illinois. They are too. And Andy Rabbit says here they're called they are called sunfish. Well, you know, like I said, there's a difference between a sunfish and a bluegill. They are different fish, really. RBL Jackson says for the person asking about incubator changes, go in small increments. It's easy to overcompensate and start chasing temps. Well, that's true. It is. Yeah, <laughs> Verna says. Yeah, Chris, I accidentally did that and it freaked me out. Blood everywhere. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It can be a mess. S.O. Swanson says all bluegill are sunfish, but not all sunfish are bluegill. I guess that's a way to say it, huh? Andy says Missouri is where I keep coming back to, so it's home for me. Yeah, I like Missouri. It's I like the Ozarks. I mean, I'm, I live in Joplin. It's very southwest corner. We're not in the Ozarks, but we're right at the edge of the Ozarks. So it's not far to get to them. <clears throat> Pigeon Passion. We're actually at the edge of, um, before I answer that next one, we're actually at the edge of the Ozarks and the Plains. So you go north, it's the Plains. You go to the uh, east and south, and it's the Ozarks. So it's, it's a nice place, really. Uh, Pigeon Passion says, have you ever been interested in raising celadon blue eggs if no why not i have raised them before i've had some before um and they i mean it's it's cool but it's kind of like queen said you know their beauty and their style went kind of smooth after a while it's kind of a neat thing but i kind of just got over it and you know i don't know they just kind of died off i guess and i just don't have any right now it's not that i'm against them necessarily um it was kind of a neat thing when i first got them but i'm over it it's not that big of a deal now um, I mean, the only difference between them and any other bird is they lay a blue egg, you know, blue green egg. Um, Buck says any closer weather feed, wait, in closer weather, feed your rabbits. I think it's colder. It's supposed to be in your colder weather, feed your rabbits. High protein feed will help them through it. Yeah. That's not a bad suggestion either. 
Spider Reva says Chris, and there's a comma, and that's it. So I'm guessing there's more to that comment. We'll come here in a minute. We got, uh, well, we've got about nine minutes left. So let's keep going. Crisis Lord says, how long can you wait for shipped eggs to go into the incubator before they are less and less fertile? And, you know, that's going to depend a little bit on how long they were stored before they got shipped, how long it took to ship them. Eggs are good for about, you know, about seven, eight days, and then the fertility starts to drop off on them. So, um, you know, it depends on how long they were in transit. I always let mine just rest overnight and then put them in the incubator the next day. Um, but if they were, you know, saved up and shipped within like a day or two, well, you got several days you could let them rest. Um, you know, it's just, it depends. And I can't answer that question because I don't know where you get them, how long it's taken to ship or any of those things. Abba says, when's the best time to hatch more quail? My first group will be a year in July. Also, don't know when to call the old ones. I do have an extra cage um, if I keep the old ones longer. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. You, I mean, as far as like, if you're looking at just replacing them because you're worried about them aging out, you know, probably this summer sometime would be a good time to do that. I've had birds go up to two, two and a half years and do just fine. They continue to lay eggs, all those things. It's not a problem. They do maybe slow down just a little bit, but not a lot. Um, but I usually don't go that long because I usually just eat them, you know. But, and if you're going to be using them for food, I mean, there's no reason to keep them longer. I mean, you can call them out whenever you want to um you know hatch some out and as those start getting close to egg laying call your old ones and let the new ones take over uh, but it's there's just a lot of different ways you can do it and there's no set like you have to do it at this time or anything like that i don't know if i answered your question or not but hopefully i gave you some thought big ross says do you ever have fishermen ask you for feathers no i never had that asked um you know, there is, there is trout fishing around here, and I guess that would be primarily what it would be used for, but not so much, it's not a huge deal where I'm at. You have to kind of, there are some trout around here, but it's not, it's not the primary species of fish. So, um, I don't know. Never had anybody ask for them though. Don says, I wish I never came back to Illinois, but I am stuck now. Illinois turned to a crap state. Yeah, I've, uh, <laughs> I don't like the uh, politics and all that in Illinois, for sure. I would uh, not like living there, probably. But anyway, it could be worse. could be a whole lot worse. Hang in there. Andy Rabbit says, once me and the kids caught a big mess of perch, we put them in a five-gallon bucket and drove to the hubby work and said, look at these we caught. And he said, I said, they are different through they were, they're white. Okay, I'm waiting for the rest of that, I'm guessing. Okay, there's more to it. Okay, all the guys were like, oh my gosh, did you catch that many, or where did you catch that many out? They all ran out to the spot after work and didn't catch one. Uh, forget what the white ones are called. Chris said it a few minutes ago. Crappie probably is what you're talking about. So yeah, they're crappie are different than perch, but... You know, they're, I guess you could look similar. They kind of have that little pucker type mouth a little bit. So, yeah, I get that. But um, Chester says, all mine are breeding stock, all your birds. So, were you asked, I think you were the one that was asking about when to replace them. You know, again, it would probably be, you know, they're a year old right now. You could go another year if you wanted to, but, you know, it'd probably be best to do it sometime this summer. Spider Reva says, Chris, one of my quails is picking or bullying another quail in specific. Why is that? I had another quail bully the same quail. Is there something with that quail that others like to do that? I, good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know why they single out certain birds and pick on them. I, I tend to just eat the aggressive ones. Um, but it may be best if they're all picking on that one bird just to remove that one bird. And, you know, cause I don't know why they would do that. Um, most of the time I notice whenever there's a lot of aggression, it's a male bird that's getting picked on by all the hens. And I'm guessing it's because he's maybe a little bit overly aggressive with breeding. They get sick of it and, you know, they fight back, I'm guessing. But I don't really know, honestly, the reason why they pick out certain birds and pick on them. It's anybody's guess, really. Somebody may have a better idea on it, but I don't know. Is that Duck Doniel? Doniel? I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. D-E-A-U-X-N-E-A-L. Maybe I got it right. <laughs> maybe. I don't know says, uh, I like your shirt quote. Well, thank you very much. We talked about it already. Yeah, one of my favorite Ronald Reagan quotes. 
Andy Rabbit says all the guys were like, oh, we already read that one. That was the second part to your story. Uh, Joe Sandy says, Chris, how long do you think it'll take quail manure to sit before it's no longer hot in the garden? Okay, so this is a question that comes up quite frequently, too. <clears throat> it depends on a lot of different things. How much carbon have you mixed in with it? How quick is it breaking down? Carbon is, um, you know, like when you have a bunch of nitrogen, you need a bunch of carbon. Those two things together will cause it to break down and cause it to make compost. Um, nitrogen reacts with the carbon. And like I said, they all break down, basically. That takes nitrogen to break carbon down. It takes carbon to make nitrogen break down. Um, so if you've got a, and it also, you, you'd have to turn it quite frequently, but you can do it in just a couple of weeks, honestly, if you want to go out and turn your pile and you get a bunch of carbon rich material, which would be like, you know, wood chips, dead leaves, um, straw, you know, any of those kinds of things are going to be carbon in your browns, so to speak. You can even do it with like paper, shredded up paper, but that'd be a lot of shredded up paper, um, cardboard, you know, you can do it with cardboard, take the tape off and stuff and shred up your cardboard. Um, there's a lot of different things you could use for your carbon. Uh, about an even, even mix, one-to-one -one ratio, basically. And then if you were to pile it all up in a big pile, make sure it's damp, not soaking wet, but damp. And then turn it about every other day, you know, just stir it up. You can get it broke down in about a week and a half, two weeks, something like that, and get good compost out of it. But it, that's a lot of work. If you want to just pile it up and let it set, you know, six months or so, it's probably okay at that point. Um, but again, it just depends on a lot of different factors. Um, but you know, you can also, I mean, if you're not going to put it on real thick, you just put a thin layer on your garden beds in the fall, it's going to be fine by spring. Um, so that would work too. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, and so Swanson says, I love how Chris has the out for quail. I eat them, <laughs> call them injured, eat them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much, I mean, you can put a lot of effort into trying to, you know, overcome a lot of issues. And most of the time, the easiest thing is just eat it, you know, get it out of the, get it out of the flock. If it's starting to have some kind of problem and it looks like it's going to, you know, get worse, eat the bird, you know, I'm mean, or, or spend weeks and, and lots of effort, you know, doctoring it and trying to make it get along and trying to, you know, you know, I mean, you can do all that if you want to, I, I don't want to. So I just get them out, you know, um, Pigeon Passion says, how often do you go live? Generally every Thursday evening, 7 o'clock Central. Yep, that was it, huh? The crappie was it. Crappie are fun to catch. If they're, I got a picture of a monster crappie I caught. I don't know how well I can find it how quickly. Um, and I probably shouldn't look for it right now because there's other comments I should need to answer to. But I caught a monster crappie on Shoal Creek that flows through Joplin. Oh, it's been several years ago. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Caught him on a bass bait, like a worm, and uh, thought I was, uh, actually filmed it, and I, I don't know if I ever posted it because I was filming that fishing trip, but I think something came out wrong. Um, there it is. There it is. Look at that. Can you see that? I don't know if the camera's going to show or not. Look at that. That's a big crappie. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> Bob Cole says, my original breeding quintet from Southwest Game Birds from December 2022 still give me four eggs per day, sometimes five. All my younger ones are less productive. Yeah, they can go for quite a while, honestly. Um, I've, I've heard people say, you know, after a year, they really, but that's not been my experience. And you've got them two years old now already, still getting plenty of egg production out of them, so. Don says the internet says the term bluegill refers to one species, white, while sunfish refers to a family of more than 30 different freshwater species that are native to North America. Yeah, I believe that. To me, sunfish are all those brightly colored, you know, you get the oranges and all that kind of stuff in them. Um, and bluegill are not quite as brightly colored. They're a little bit duller. Andy Rabbit says, um, I didn't know when I caught them. I also didn't know there was a limit on them either. I was way over. Yeah, there is a limit on on the amount of uh, crappie you can catch. Most, I don't know if there's a limit on perch, but most other fish, there are limits on how many you can catch. Don says, I bought a bluegill, I bought, I brought a bluegill home and put it in an aquarium once and it was just ugly tan in the water 
and the light out of water, it was colorful and pretty. I know that is weird in how they do that. We, uh, when I was a kid, we, uh, we caught some perch. We were fishing with my grandpa. We caught some perch, little tiny perch. They weren't very big at all. So we had a fish tank at home with some goldfish in it, big bubble eye goldfish. And, uh, so we brought these perch home, five or six of them and put them in the tank and, uh, man, they were ferocious. They ate the eyes out of that goldfish. I mean, the bubble eyes, they ate them. The goldfish was had no eyes left. Goldfish lived for a long time. But anyway, it was, yeah, if they got big, it'd be scary to swim. That's for sure. Big Ross says, um, I know a standard compost pile, they recommend a minimum of three-foot pile, which is why pallets work to frame the pile up. Yeah, for sure. Um, always good. And I've got a wire, wire cages. You know, it's like, fence wire basically they give them away free sometimes at the local recycle center during earth day and i, I go down and pick one up and those are what i use but you know pallets would work great too um verna says or you feed it to your dog lol yeah you could do that too joe sandy says when should you not eat a bird well <clears throat> i have a couple of rules of thumb on that one if the bird is obviously ill and there's something like like infections, any of those kinds of things. I don't know what it is or if it just died and I don't know how it died. I don't eat those. That's pretty much it. Um, yeah, it's about time to wrap this one up, isn't it? Oh my gosh, we're two minutes past. Let me get through one or two more comments. We'll get off of here. So Bill Thompson says, I have about a 15 foot long pile of quail manure and pine pellets and the poop trays that it's from 10 months old until this week. Is it okay if it has pine pellets before broke down by the manure. If it's all broke down and it, you don't know, have like big pine pellets in there, yeah, it's fine. The thing I would worry about with pine pellets is they tend to be really acidic. So I wouldn't put them on fresh. I'd wait till they're broke down uh, before you put them on. Or if you're going to, you know, there's some things that like acidic soil, like roses and stuff, you know, use that for them. Uh, Bob Cole says, um, I think it's roses that like acidic soil. Blueberries. Blueberries like acidic soil. So there you go. Uh, Bob says, I use small uh, sawdust, small wood chips in the poop trays. The birds do spill some feed, and I dump them in a compost pile. Water occasionally, it gets garden usable pretty quick. A couple of months. Yeah, that's the way to do it for sure. Um, RBL Jackson says, crappie are fun to catch. One of the best, in my opinion, to eat. And I went two weeks ago and caught about eight keepers. They are one of the best to eat. I agree. They're, they're good. And they are fun to catch. It's kind of funny because you catch a crappie, and it just fights like crazy for just a few minutes and then it just flops over like it's dead, you know, it comes in like it's dead. Um, Joe Sandy says, if you suspect they're sick, do you eat or dispose of it? No, if I suspect they're sick, I don't eat them. They, they go in the trash or whatever. All right, guys, we're going to wrap this one up. I'm a little bit over, but that's okay. I like hanging out with y'all. Um, thanks for joining me tonight. We'll see you guys hopefully next week. I don't see any reason why not. And, um, I guess until then, as always, God bless.